Good, so what I decided to do for my presentation uh, in order to avoid redundancy with uh, what Madeleine talked about and what Sergio um, talked about, um, I wanted to give you an overview over organoids. Because what I think most of you have to keep in mind is that when most people, uh, most biologists talk about organoids, I think the majority is talking about something that is a bit different from what we are focused on here. Um, and I'll explain that. Can, can, is there any way to turn off this slide or so? Or? Yes. Does that make it better? Yeah, OK. So, so, so many of you may have seen that. This is when you, that's what happens when you search a, a, a PubMed for the term organoid. Uh, you see that for a long time it has been uh, drizzling a little bit, but then, but then there's this enormous um, 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 peak with um, uh, uh, starting from uh, around 2010, and after you hear my lecture, you will you will know why that is. Um, uh, it, it's it's going down not because of our uh, of our course here, but uh, because this year is only partially uh, uh, included, right? But. I, I should say when you go into the details of this, there's two things that, 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 that are important. First of all, the term organoid uh, 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 has been classically used uh, in various different ways. So depending on how you do that search, you can also get a second peak here because in, in the late uh, 20th century, uh, some scientists used the term organoid synonymous with organelle. And uh, so if you go through the old literature, you have to be careful not to get uh, 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 confused. Um, and the second thing is that I think a large fraction of this peak does not come from neural um, organoids. So why are organoids uh, so important? I think we all know it's this, it's this the, 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 the idea, the, the, the vision that eventually we will be able to derive pluripotent stem cells from any patient uh, through various different um, specific cellular processes, derive organoids from them, then use them for modeling particular diseases, for testing specific drugs on a specific patient, uh, and eventually even for regenerative um, medicine. But what I think is truly the reason, so, so, so the w one thing that hopefully will become clear during, during the first part of my lecture is that it, the, 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 the hyperbolic organoid is not because it is a very, very new technology. There have been technological uh, improvements that are quite significant, particularly in the, in the, in the, in the, in the area of um, uh, brain modeling. Um, but I think what really is the reason for the current hype is because there's a number of technological developments that are currently coming together and that together really generate a big revolution in, in biological sciences. This is genome sequencing, which happened uh, really in its current form in the past five or so years, uh, reprogramming, which uh, also only in the past 10 years became widely uh, accessible, and uh, uh, multiple in vitro systems, and then the idea of doing uh, genome um, editing. And I will later on show you how one can combine those to actually generate, um, uh, so learn something about disease. Now, um, uh, I, 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 I first, so I want to structure my lecture into into three parts. The first part, I want to give you a broad overview over um, organoids. Uh, this will be uh, the, 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 uh, something about the principle of organoid uh, generation um, and about uh, 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 what the historical basis uh, for organoids. Um, I will particularly talk about intestinal organoids because this is a neural crowd, and so maybe you're not so familiar uh, with that. But I think it is important to understand the principles of this system as well if you want to uh, be able to understand your own organoid system. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about the brain organoids, those things that have not been talked about. Uh, very briefly about other organoids, disease modeling, and uh, where the frontiers are. And then I will move to, to our own uh, work uh, and, and, and tell you uh, about two research projects that we, are, that we are currently doing, or that has, we have done. So we've talked a lot about definitions. Uh, I don't want to actually spend too much time right now on this. I uh, just wanted to make one point, which is uh, it is important to have a definition. Uh, and uh, this may not be obvious to everyone, but if ever you want to, for example, write a patent application about something that you find, the problem is that right now you cannot use the term organoid because it is just not defined. So once we reach a clear definition of that, uh, that makes the life of a lot of people 
uh, much easier and will also help move our uh, field forward. So I will have, I have, I have uh, here one definition that uh, uh, Madeleine and I, uh, in, a, in a review in 2014, uh, set up. Uh, and then on the next slide, I will show you uh, uh, the definitions from, 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 from key other people, uh, which I think are very similar. Um, and so uh, the, the, the term organoid uh, comes from, uh, 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 comes from uh, or it means like it's like an organ, right? Um, and, and I think there's a number of defining features for um, an organoid. I think the first one is that there has to be some kind of a self-organization. So the, 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 at least the, uh, most of the cell types that are present in an organ have to be present. Uh, second, the organoid has to be able to recapitulate some of the specific functions of the uh, organ. For example, in the brain, the neurons have to fire. Uh, and as we reach more and more uh, 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 mature organoid systems, this becomes increasingly more defined. This is actually more important for other organoid systems. For example, in the kidney, you would expect that there's some kind of a filtration activity uh, 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 and so on. Um, and uh, the other important uh, feature uh, uh, is that the cells are grouped together and somehow spatially organized in a way that is similar to the actual um, organ. Now, um, other definitions uh, are from, uh, one is from Hans Klevers. He wrote another review in 2016. Um, he included, uh, or he, he mentioned that organoids have to come from uh, stem cells that they have to have the organ-specific uh, cell types and it has to uh, self-organoid. And I'm part of a task force of the um, ASCB that is currently writing a white paper about organoid uh, uh, research and one uh, uh, task is also to, 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 to define uh, the term organoid. This definition is not from me, it's from another scientist in that task force. Um, but I just wanted to uh, 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 mention another key aspect of this. So what uh, uh, he brought up was that we shouldn't use the term stem cells because stem cells is, a, is in itself an ill-defined term. So um, um, uh, he suggested that we use the word a renewable tissue source. That it would be that could be this, this this can be any kind of self cell type that can self renew and also generate the organ, what, what, irrespective of whether it's a stem cell um, or not. Uh, that is cultured in a defined environment. Uh, and it has the in vivo like complexity and itself. So why, why does it have to be renewable? I don't, I don't understand. Like because otherwise, otherwise an explant would be an organoid. So for instance, if you get a tumor out, self-renewal. Uh, uh, very similar to what it would be for even liver tissue. I mean, I mean, because, because, because if, if, it is, if it is not renewable, then that means in principle the experiment cannot be repeated. So that's that's was that was his was uh, Seth Gardner, uh, who who had and 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 and, and I, I, I actually I actually it was not my idea but but I actually I mean I, what I really like is so I, I I really like taking out the term stem cells from the definition because otherwise you know like you know the, the most common organoids are the gut the intestinal organoids right and there's still a debate about whether the LGR5 positive cells are stem cells or not, right? So depending on whether they are, if in, at some point somebody finds this to be in my one positive uh, plus four cells, then all of a sudden the whole field will collapse, right? Because the organoids are no longer organoids. And so th this, is, this, is, this is a problem, right? That you have to think about, then, then what do you do with all those patent applications that use the term organoids, right? So, so, so I think that is, that is a bit of an, an issue. But, Maybe one could be even broader, but I think I think it, it, it gets actually, you know, just just to to, to give you the <laughs> a feel for this, right? Uh, Madeleine and I have uh, written a patent application in this field, right? And we were asked to actually uh, 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 describe why our patent does not uh, cover the human brain, right? So so this is this is how it goes, right? <laughs> because the, so so a real brain, right? Uh, uh, well, it, it's cultured, right? But if you if you would take a real brain and put it into culture, uh, it 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 would fulfill many of these. But it's not from a renewable source, right? So that's that's that what it takes but care it of. Definitely not renewable, except for the real brain. No, right. so but if you leave that out, if you leave that out, if you if you say if you just don't say that, right? So if you, if you don't talk about the source, you have to say something about the source. 
of the tissue, right? You can say stem cells, no, no, no. but that's a, you can say cultured cells. That would be another possibility. But I mean, I don't want to bore you too much with this. And we, you know, I mean, I think it, there's a problem with definitions anyway, because some people, you know, uh, y y they have to be widely um, accepted in order to, to actually work. But I do think it's important to some degree. Right? So now, I've given, I, I, instead of giving you like the one definition, I wanted to give you a feeling for the for the for the various aspects that are important. Uh, and 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 as we move from you know rosettes to uh, uh, to organoid culture, to fused organoids, and so on, and so on. I think it would be important. Where is the where where, where are the limitations here? Um, what I wanted to do now is I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on 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 uh, the fact that actually, uh, you know, this is really resting on giants. I mean, there's a, there's a very very long tradition of uh, of 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 of, of uh, uh, three dimensional cell culture, uh, and some of the principles of uh, self-organization have been found long before they were uh, mouse as a model system and so on, right? So, and one of the uh, uh, kind of leaders in this field that I really would like to point out uh, is Johannes Holtfretter. Uh, he was originally German, uh, then had to leave, I went to Cambridge, uh, Canada, and, and, and the United States. And he did two key experiments. The first one was he basically showed that when you dissociate the cells of uh, an amphibian gastrula, they will re aggregate uh, into something that resembles the original shape and there will be different cell types because some of them will migrate out and other ones uh, will not. And the second one he did was he, um, uh, 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 connect, he combined endoderm, ectoderm with connective tissue and then generated what I think could be called the very first organoid-like tissue uh, where um, uh, 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 the, the cells will sort out into, into ectodermal, endodermal. Um, uh, so the ectoderm is here and the endoderm is here. And the mesoderm or mesenchymal cells are accumulating in the middle. And that illustrates one of the very key, the first key principle of organoid generation, which is cells are able to sort out. They are able to, to find each other, to find the right neighbors and then form groups and this in this way organize a tissue. But this is not renewable. I, that's why I don't, that's why it was not called an organoid, right? No, but I, see for instance, this beautiful experiment, there are about cell sorting and cell organization. Unfortunately, they're not renewable because presumably, you know, I guess it's too late to develop it, right here. Yeah, I wouldn't call this an organoid. I would call, I would think they would be renewable. Those ectodermal cells would make neural rosettes if you played them down and you could keep them alive for... Yeah, but they're not going to make so I think what you're referring to, there, there, is, there is one actually, I, 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 there, is, there is a whole, you, you, you actually bring up an important point, because there is a whole body of literature and a whole field of research, which was done in the 19, I was talking with some students over breakfast uh, about this today, uh, 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 this went on when I was a master's student, and, and, and people were laughing about the research, because it was like fringe research. People, a lot of people did dissociation of uh, retina, for example, chicken retina mostly, and then re-aggregation. Right? So these re-aggregates, are they organoids, yes or no? We can debate. I would not call them an organoid. But, 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 so, but, but I think that's the question, right? Do we want to call this an organoid or not? I don't know. I, it, the, the jury is out, right? For me, it's always about self-organization. The ability to do more than just, you know, you could have put them together this and get you know, mixed around. Yeah. Were these cells completely mixed together to start with, or were they just an ectoderm ball hooked up to an endoderm? No, they were, they were, they were separate. Completely mixed together. Yeah. Completely mixed. So then that is self-organization. That is no, no. It fulfills self-organization. It's just not from a stem cell. And I right? I think that is the question. It's from an embryo, right? No, it's after differentiation. It's 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 from all kinds of cells and not a stem cell. So it is not. So what I think is the. I mean, if we include this in the definition, then re-aggregates would also be. Yeah, I I I don't know. It's. It's a good point. Maybe one should. I it's then, a, yeah. it's so because difficult. then, if you made a, an organoid from a, a neuroepithelium, yes, that would not be an organoid. Why not? Yes, why not? So why isn't this an organoid? No, this is. 
That's what I'm saying. Oh. But it doesn't have. To no, 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 no. I think he was bringing up that this so people would probably think this is an organoid, but under the definition, under the definition. Yeah, huh? but it's not. But it's not renewable. In it's the not process. a homogeneous stem cell population. Like for, for the brain it's talking. Yeah. And it's not renewable. It's, it's true. Not right? Renewable. You take one frog, you do the experiment, you take the next That's frog, but you can't like maintain it. We know we can take mass and embryonic neural tissue. We can pass it back to the right culture condition. Every time I think about the brain and I think about renewable, I have you know, some sort of reservation. I think in the intestinal field, people just renew that again and again almost. The cell divisions are the same, but here, even renewing for a couple of passages is going to change the fate of the cells, for instance. I mean, that's what Oliver was also mentioning, I guess. I have a problem with what renewable actually means in the nervous system. But if or even for the nervous system. If they conditions for pluripotent stem cells, then they also wouldn't be renewable. But Just because we figured out the right things to put on them to keep them renewable. Yeah, but they're Which, by the way, which yeah, but I think the ethical 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 <laughs> no, but I, I, I think the reason why this is important, uh, the reason why this is important is because I think it, 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 it does have some influence. It, it is going to have some influence on the field, right? Do we, do we take all this classical stuff and include it and call it organoids? Are we restrictive? Are we trying to say organoids are something special? Or are we just saying it's all, you know, it's, it's more broad? And for example, there's a whole uh, large field of uh, tumor tissue culture where people took Tumors, dissociate, put them together, and made them. They're not renewable. Are they an organoid? Yes or no? A tumor is not an organ. It'll have to be an organ. Well, well, well. <laughs> so that, that, that's another one. So, so, so a tumor is a pathological organ. organ. It's, but, a, it's an organ in a pathological state. But an organ is or, an organ is also not an organ. It's an organoid. So everything that but looks has an organ. If it's an organ, then it needs to have qualities of an organ, because that means like an organ. But I think organoid refers to some site architecture, right? That's what it all refers to. This is an implied uh, definition, though. Right. The actual definition is like an organism. Exactly. So. What does an organ have? That's then what I would come back to. Well, I mean, I think what you're referring to is, you know, there's the healthy organ, yeah. and then there's the diseased organ. And the diseased organ can be very, very, very different. And I think the tumor, in a way, is a diseased organ, right? And, and I think we should include that. It's organized and has like, you know, I don't know. Well, some more or less, right? Some do, okay. Some do, but some don't. And, 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 and if we, even if we, let's say, by definition we would exclude, we would exclude an entire field <laughs> right now. Cancer organ yeah. would have to change their name. I mean, I think we also have to be inclusive. Yeah, I think that would actually be not bad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you take a, so, so, sorry, sorry, why after, why after, just because now it's hyped, right? Yeah. After 20 years of research on taking tumors and put them into culture, all of a sudden, because other people have developed a new method that is, uh, is very hyped, you need to rename this into the term organoid. I do not understand that. It's the same thing. We have, we have, we have generated a huge mess by calling all kinds of cells stem cells, simply to get our grants to it, right? You, but if you manage to grow the tumor in vitro, why don't you call this a tumoroid? <laughs> What's wrong with that? I mean, this is, this is, then, then we know what we're talking about, right? <laughs> it's just, if, 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 if we make a definition that includes the whole world. Indeed. But I mean, if you grow a tumor, and you, you know, because what people did when they took tumors and they just left them there, you know, for most tumors, they actually do not propagate them. So if you're able to propagate... They're not self-renewable. Right. If you are able to propagate a tumor in three dimensions over time, uh, I think that that's actually a very. Answer. You're bringing up a very, very good point, right? So, 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 get a, 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 a thought experiment, right? So, you take a piece of tumor and you culture it, not knowing where the surgeon exactly cut in which region of the tumor, and uh, you make an organoid, uh, and you have some scientific findings. Next person needs to use another patient, another surgeon, and does that. But if I figure out, then I wouldn't, I, it, I'm not sure it's that's an organ, but if somebody figures out a way to actually take the tumor, 
keep it in suspension culture in a way so that the complexity, the entire complexity of the cells, then it becomes a renewable source and then you generate That's something. The then I would call That's that the point. Renewable or not, as long as it keeps the structure, right? It's already something novel which people have not been able, because usually they were put in monolayers, they would just, right? Or, or they were immortalized, which again is the way people would actually do culture, right? So I think there is some novelty there. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know why we're having this discussion, and I think it's very good that we're having this discussion, because I have this discussion whenever I talk with people who are surgeons or who come from the, the clinics, right? Because they're, they're much closer to the patient, whereas I'm much closer to the fundamental basic biological principles. We can have the same discussion afterwards when I talk about our tumor model, where you also will see it's a, like a Drosophila, Drosophilist approach towards tumor genesis. So how are we going to call that your model? It's a genetically modified organoid. It's clearly an organoid. It's a cerebral organoid. But it's tumor-like, so huh? it's, a, it's an organ tumor. We can, we can, we can come back to that afterwards, because it's a very interesting discussion Let's there. Let's find a new name. Huh? Let's find a new name. <laughs> For mine. <laughs> okay, anyway. Is that an organoid? <laughs> Just to clarify everything, that's what I mean. Yeah, so this, this is another, ex so, so we, we talked about the two principles of organoid uh, formation, right? The first one is cells sorting out, the second one is self-organization, and I think there's nothing that illustrates the, uh, I hope nobody is perturbed by those images, so I put them away. Uh, there's nothing that is uh, more, uh, that is better suited to uh, illustrate the absolutely enormous capability of human cells to self-organize than a teratoma. Teratoma are uh, 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 relatively benign ovarian tumors. A large fraction of all ovari ovarian, uh, benign ovarian tumors are uh, teratomas. Um, and, and basically, they are, they are, they are, they are uh, 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 oocytes uh, recapitulating the, the, the development um, of a human, and they reach an absolutely incredible level if the, uh, uh, of self-organization, you can make such sections through them, you can find brain tissue in there, you can, and I think it's a, it's a, it, 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 teratoma research goes way, 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 way back uh, to the middle of the 20th century, if I'm not mistaken, um, and, um, and uh, uh, the, 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 these principles of self-organization were, and I think they have a, a, a large number of uh, implications, including ethical implications. You do find brain tissue in there. In my view, some of the brain tissue in the teratoma um, is, 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 is larger than a typical cerebral organoid. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we wouldn't give that any uh, 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 ethical um, consideration, but we can save that for Friday. So uh, teratomas, I think, illustrate the self-organizing um, principles of um, uh, organized. And I, I wanted to highlight a number of other uh, uh, historically important uh, development that, that's, that led to uh, organize. Uh, the very first one actually goes back to 1907 from Wilson. Wilson, uh, uh, so, so much of this is actually the principles of cell culture. Wilson, uh, I think, uh, uh, used uh, sponges. Uh, uh, to, to, to actually artificially uh, 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 keep some of the cells um, in culture. And then there was the uh, hanging drop method from uh, Harrison that was also developed around the same time, the very first uh, method to actually um, uh, culture cells. And then there was a number of, of uh, very important uh, developments that led to the formation of extracellular matrix that can be used in organoid culture. This started from the um, uh, reconstitution of uh, collagen in the 1950s to the characterization of uh, laminin as an extracellular matrix protein, and then finally in 1977, the uh, 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 generation of the substance where most of my lab budget uh, uh, goes in, uh, which is known as um, matrigel. Um, actually, does, 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 do people know how matrigel is made? Huh? Yeah, it's How? isolated from humans. From human cells, right? It's extracellular matrix. Right? Exactly, what right? Human? What human? What human? Quick, quick, quick hint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a control, right? It's a Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma is there. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so this is her version of the history, you think, of the organoids? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you have you disagree? No, no, no. I'm putting in the context of the previous discussion again. You know, and I'm thinking, for instance, for the Harrison hanging trial, is that the, how it was developed, or this is how what she would consider also. This is just some, no, 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 I, 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 I don't, I don't, this is not about giving, giving credit to individuals. I, th I think they're just, these are just important steps that actually led, whether without that, we, I, I don't want to be dogmatic Build about this. Build or to say that this was done for a long time? What yeah, saying that this was done for a long time, right? Okay. And then there's a number of developments that I consider very important, uh, or a number of publications that I consider one uh, very important. I, I will talk briefly about the work of Yoshiki Sasai. We heard about this um, already from others. Uh, uh, Sato with the, with the, uh, uh, um, with the first um, uh, development of an organoid system that is still used in the same way. Um, and then uh, the formation of optic uh, cups also by Yoshiki Sasai's uh, lab, and then we've heard about Madeleine's paper um, already. So I think one thing that is important is to actually know that the generation of any organoid follows a number of, 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 of steps that are very um, important. As, uh, I, I think the first uh, important key step in, in generating an organoid system is there has to be a source of uh, material. Now, in the case of brain organoids, this is easy because we always use pluripotent stem cells, but as you will see later on, for other types of organoids, the choice of the source material and the availability of the source material is really um, 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 important. Then, uh, these cells have to somehow be brought into the right fate, and this typically follows the methodology that was developed in 2D. So there is, there is a long uh, history about patterning uh, cells in 2D. We've heard uh, 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 some absolutely great examples from uh, Lawrence, how beautifully this can be done um, in the brain. Uh, in, in, in endodermal organs, this basically follows just the patterning along the anterior posterior axis with various morphogens, the most common being the wind signaling pathway. Uh, or retinoic acid, um, and, and, then, and then these cultures have to be brought into three dimensions. Uh, I have to give credit to uh, Sergio here. I'm going to use quite a few images from his very beautiful uh, poster that uh, uh, is available from uh, Stem Cell Technologies, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it illustrates many of the principles that I'm, that I'm going to show here. Um, and uh, there's different ways of how to bring the cultures into 3D. So one is the hanging drop uh, method, which is a, a very classical method, but it is also still uh, used. Uh, the second one that is most commonly used now in cerebral organoids is the, the aggregation, the rapid aggregation in a V or, or u bottom um, uh, 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 shaped cells. And then to maintain in 3D, it's typically matrigel uh, embedding or detachment from place and keeping them in, uh, in three-dimensional um, suspension. And then the, 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 the last very important part is to actually keep the tissues in 3D. Uh, 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 one way to do that is to, we heard from Madeleine already, uh, to use a spinning bioreactor. The art here is to, 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 to keep the culture uh, in a floating state so that it doesn't sink down to the ground and doesn't start attaching because even the most low attachment uh, uh, material uh, eventually is going to uh, allow the cells to attach and to, to, to actually move in, uh, into a 2D. Uh, there's other uh, things we've heard about the, op uh, the, 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 the shaker and in some organoid tissues actually low um, attachment plates. Um, are actually used. But I wanted to say these are, these are the general principles. So if you would like to develop an organoid system from scratch, you have to, you have to make those four um, decisions. And you will see that as we go through the various different organoid systems, how uh, these things are actually um, solved. So I now wanted to become a bit more, um, are there any questions about this historical part besides the definition? OK. Um, so I now wanted to become a bit more specific, and I wanted to start talking about specific uh, organoid models. And I first wanted to give you uh, a little bit of, 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 of uh, uh, information and background on the, um, on the uh, uh, development of the intestinal organoid system. But because most of you are, uh, uh, all of you are studying the nervous system, 
uh, I first need to give you a little bit of background on gut uh, physiology. So this is a, a movie uh, from uh, the lab of Hans Klevers um, that will show you the basic physiology um, of the um, intestine. As you know, uh, uh, the intestine uh, has an internal surface that is, that is gigantic uh, and um, uh, it has these uh, villi that increase the surface and allow efficient uh, resorption of uh, digested uh, material um, and the intestine turns over very, very rapidly. We are, we are uh, 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 wasting uh, kilograms of uh, cell material every week uh, from the intestine and this is uh, renewed from stem cells and actually the identification of those stem cells. Uh, so the stem cells are located in these uh, crypts that are uh, hidden down here and, and um, the identification of these stem cells was key for generating the gut organoids and they're down here in the, in the uh, intestinal stem cell niche uh, located between the so-called punnet cells, which form the stem cell niche. And they express a key marker, which is called LGR5. They will divide, and then as they divide, uh, so the stem cells will divide, uh, uh, and, then, and then the cells will continue to divide, uh, and they will differentiate as they move up in a conveyor belt-like uh, 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 way. And they will start differentiating, most of them into uh, enterocytes, but also some into goblet cells or um, enteroendocrine cells. And once they've reached the top of the uh, villi, the cells will be shed uh, into the lumen and they will um, disappear. So one important thing to remember here is that the gut is a very rapidly self-renewing tissue. And this illustrates the two fundamental principles of organoid generation. So far, when you think about the brain, uh, what we all do is to recapitulate the development of the brain. But that's only one of two fundamental principles of organoid uh, 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 genesis. The second one is to recapitulate organ regeneration. And that is done in these intestinal um, organoids. And the key to this was the identification of the signaling pathways that actually sustain the intestinal stem cells. So as I said, the stem cells are located down here in the crypts of the um, um, intestine. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are these uh, very long elongated cells that are located between those uh, uh, panet cells, which are much bigger. And uh, they express the marker LGR5. And there's really four key signaling pathways that uh, regulate those stem cells. And the most important one is the wind signaling pathway. It had been known for quite some time that there is a wind signal coming from mesenchymal cells that surround the crypt uh, that activates wind signaling here and this is absolutely the key trigger for uh, inducing the proliferation uh, of those intestinal stem cells. So there have been many, many attempts to actually uh, 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 um, culture the intestinal crypts. But what was always missing was a good way to activate the wind signaling pathway. And I, I think actually that one key uh, discovery or key finding for, for enabling the generation of uh, intestinal organoids was the identification of a molecule that is called R-spondin which can easily be generated in vitro and can be used as an activator of the wind signaling pathway. It actually uh, binds to a co-receptor of the wind pathway. It's a co-activator of the wind pathway. And uh, because wind itself, uh, as many of you will know, is, is very hard to actually uh, generate um, in vitro, but aspondin is very easy to generate. So, so the, the ability to activate the wind pathway was actually very important for generating those organoids. Uh, the other pathways, uh, 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 BMP signaling, can be inhibited by nogging. Uh, Notch activation has been another uh, a problem which was solved in one case with an activating peptide, in the other case with co-culture with other cells, uh, and EGF uh, has been, uh, had been uh, uh, possible to generate in vitro for, for quite some time. So there have been really two ways of how these organoids were, were, were originally generated. I wanted to mention that, that, uh, that there has been a first paper from the lab of Calvin Kuhl um, that actually uh, used a co-culture method uh, that came very close to the generation of um, intestinal um, organoids. So, 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 so the, um, 
the uh, 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 in this case the the, the, the the crypts were cultured with adjacent um, mesenchyme, and then the different signaling pathways, including the wind signaling pathway, were uh, activated in vitro, but there was no way to activate the notch pathway in vitro, and that was done through the co-culture with the, with the mesenchymal um, tissue. The problem, and the reason why this culture method did not become viral, um, is uh, because uh, this cannot be sustained. So, so you can make these cultures uh, for some time, but eventually they degenerate, uh, and you have to start them new again. And that is very different from the groundbreaking method that was developed by Toshi Sato in the lab of um, Hans Klevers, uh, who then managed to generate a complete in vitro system that can start with um, LGR5 positive cells. So they've managed to sort LGR5 positive cells up to single cells, which they put um, into culture and uh, in a, in a, uh, in a, with a cocktail of uh, um, um, uh, chemokines that will um, activate the wind pathway, activate EGF receptor pathway, the uh, notch pathway, and inhibit the BMP pathway. And uh, when you add them with those um, 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 cocktails uh, and then embed them in uh, matrigel, uh, you get these um, organoids. Again, the Sclavers lab is always great in generating these uh, 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 3D movies, so I just want to give you a simplified version of how these um, organoids work. They start, they can start from si single uh, crypt bottom cells or intestinal uh, stem cells, which will then divide. And the key uh, 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 feature here is that some of these stem cells will actually turn into panet cells. So the, 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 the generation of these organoids depends on the fact that the stem cell can generate its own niche. And then that initially they generate these balls of tissues and then they generate these spontaneous bulges uh, where the cells then will sort out and uh, the stem cells will accumulate here at the bottom of these bulges. And, um, and Sclavos lab could then show that the, 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 the transport of the cells along this uh, 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 and, and epithelium to some degree is regenerated and that the uh, cells are then shed into the lumen once they reach uh, what, once they reach the, 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 these regions which are equivalent to, uh, to, the, to the villi. Now, this method now uh, stands out with its simplicity. As you see, it's, 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 it's a lot simpler than uh, brain organoids. Uh, and for this reason, it is actually also very widely uh, used by now. The important thing is that you can take the method and you can vary it. You can vary it really um, a lot. And I just wanted to point out a few uh, things that have been done. It has been used to generate liver organoids and pancreas organoids. Um, 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 and uh, I, I spare you the details, but in all of those cases, basically the key is twofold. The first one is you start with different starting stem cells. So in all of those cases, the identification uh, of, the, of, the, of the stem cell population. Also in the case of the intestine, it was key to identify LGR5 as a marker for the intestinal stem cells. Um, and then for the stomach organoids, for example, the chief cells as the, as the stem cells uh, uh, were identified. Um, in the case of uh, liver, uh, you use some cells which it's not clear whether they are stem cells or not. Uh, and in pancreas, it's a similar uh, story. And then you just basically in vitro recapitulate the signaling pathways that, that uh, sustain those stem cells, building on previous literature that identified those signaling pathways, uh, and then use for maintenance of the culture always more or less the same um, methodology. So this has led to a very, very large number of uh, different organoid systems. Now, I should mention clearly here that these organoids, they're called organoids, but of course they're extremely simple. And so there is, in the field, there is a debate as to, as to it's pretty much like what we had, uh, I think, yesterday in our field, right? So there, there's different systems, right? You can use these very simple uh, uh, organoid systems. They are used for drug screening. They are used for disease modeling. I'll show a few examples later. Uh, they are used for individual uh, disease modeling. 
uh, in a way, they are much, much simpler, so, so, so the progress is a bit faster than for the, for the brain organoids. Uh, the level of complexity is also much lower. But of course, they also do not recapitulate the entire complexity. So for example, you do not have an enteric nervous system. The, 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 uh, the gut actually is a long tube. It's not a little ball. So in all of these organs, all of these organs are good for recapitulating certain aspects of the uh, physiology of those uh, organs. And this is the recurring theme that we've now emphasized several times. Uh, there's different, many, many different organoid uh, systems and you have to, depending on the scientific questions that you're asking, you have to choose the right system that is, that is correct for you and that is true for these as well. Because there are many, much more complex systems. For example, uh, the first really uh, important uh, 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 such uh, 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 complex uh, organoid was um, published in 2014 uh, for the for the for gastric organoids and and so this is an alternative way of generating gastric organoid where you start with pluripotent stem cells by uh, now not wind uh, not 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 uh, smart inhibition but activation adding uh, active in a you drive the cells to definitive ectoderm and then uh, uh, wind activation <coughs> FGF4 noggin retinoic acid you drive them to uh, to posteriorize them to go to posterior foregut uh, and then you specify with another set of growth factors a particular area of the, um, of the stomach uh, and uh, embed in the matrigel uh, and uh, keep, keep the culture with EGF uh, and observe the differentiation. So I put this up just to, 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 to uh, avoid the impression that all uh, endoderm organoids are simple and all uh, ectoderm organoids are complex. For uh, various endoderm organs, there is also very complex uh, organoid um, systems that can be used um, uh, 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 depending on what people want to do. So to, to summarize these endodermal organs, uh, organoids, uh, there's basically three ways of how to, 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 to generate them. The first one uh, was, was, was the first one that I told you about. This is a co-culture with the mesenchymal uh, tissue that forms the niche. Uh, then there is the uh, tissue-derived um, organoids that uh, are easy to handle but uh, uh, do not recapitulate the full three-dimensional uh, organization, only a part of it. Uh, and then there's the IPS or, 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 or ES cell derived organoids that are much better in recapitulating the um, architecture. Now what can we do with those organoids? Uh, for, the, for the intestinal organoids, in my view, um, uh, one of the, 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 the key breakthroughs uh, in the application of them was really the uh, modeling of uh, cystic fibrosis. And this is illustrated here. I just wanted to, to actually give you the, 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 the bottom line of this. I mean, basically, um, uh, what was done here was there was an, an, an assay that has been developed that um, uh, uh, recapitulates liquid uptake into the lumen of the um, gut. As many of you may know, cystic fibrosis uh, affects uh, a, a transmembrane channel uh, and uh, the mutations result in uh, an uh, inability um, of the cells to control uh, water flow, uh, to, to control water uptake into the, into the lumen of the um, intestine. And this can be recapitulated in this um, assay uh, by um, adding forscolin and uh, uh, inhibiting the uh, PKA. Uh, forscolin addition uh, uh, leads to uh, a swelling of the organoid because it activates the uptake of uh, liquid into the lumen. Um, and in uh, 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 certain uh, uh, cystic fibrosis uh, mutants, this ability is dramatically um, reduced. And if you combine all of them together, there's no water uptake. Uh, and then uh, one can actually rescue this with uh, certain chemical compounds. And this has actually led uh, in the Netherlands to a, to a, to a, to a, to a change in regulatory um, activities. Basically, there are uh, rare mutations in the uh, CFTR uh, channel that uh, do not react to the common cystic fibrosis drugs, but there are new drugs that uh, can be helpful for these kind of patients, but they're incredibly expensive, and so the health insurance doesn't cover them. Uh, and so they've agreed so that, those, so that all the patients in the Netherlands that suffer from those rare mutations 
uh, can undergo an organoid test where uh, the, uh, the, the doctor would find out whether they would react to those drugs and if the organoid test is uh, positive, then the health insurance will cover the, the, the test. And this is actually uh, across the entire country. It, it, uh, 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 it only affects a small number of patients. It's a proof of concept study, but I think it shows how actually uh, organoids can really be used uh, to, 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 to target medicine in a better way and to, to, to help people who you otherwise would not be able to afford it. Um, in, in uh, endodermal organoids have also been used in a number of other things. So they have been uh, used intestinal organoids for colon cancer, cystic fibrosis, uh, and one prominent example was to the modeling of Helicobacter pylori uh, infections for kidney organoids that can also be generated in a similar way. Polycystic kidney disease has been uh, modeled for liver organoids, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and allergy syndrome. This is just a list of a few things that um, actually have been done. And finally, uh, these intestinal organoids had also been used for uh, 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 regeneration. So basically, you can, you can introduce uh, the organoids rectally into the uh, intestine of, uh, uh, no, I think into, into the colon of a, of a, of a, of a, of a mouse, uh, and then they will integrate into the uh, uh, wall of the of the um, gut, and uh, will be able to repair the wound. There's again a nice movie for this. So basically, uh, 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 what this shows is a is a is a gut that is actually um, in this case chemically um, injured, and uh, the idea is that the organoid will um, integrate and uh, uh, will repair this um, wound. Now. Uh, the, um, uh, this, this has been used to uh, 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 repair some forms of um, colitis um, already, and uh, this leads to a, to a longer survival um, of, the, of the mice. Now, so, so, so far I've, I've, I've been telling you about these uh, endodermal uh, organoid uh, systems. I think one thing that's characteristic, uh, characteristic for them is that they're all uh, derived from adults themselves and they recapitulate the, the, um, uh, the um, uh, regeneration of the um, organ rather than the development of the organ. I actually had prepared quite a lot of slides about, about uh, Yoshiki Sasai's work. I think we've actually heard quite a bit about this already. So what I would like to do now is I would like to uh, skip over this a little bit and rather uh, cover two research projects that are actually going on um, in my own uh, lab. I think, uh, um, I think there's, 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 there's not so much new in, 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 in those slides. Uh, it's, it's basically a recap of, of the uh, systems that Yoshiki Sasai um, has actually uh, generated. Now, uh, I want to start by, by, by just uh, recapitulating the uh, method that uh, Madeleine has uh, generated when she was a postdoc uh, in my lab. Basically, we uh, start with uh, pluripotent stem cells, which we dissociate and then re-aggregate at the bottom of a 96 well plate. Uh, we then do a media, we then culture them for, for just five or six days under uh, differentiation uh, conditions uh, and then change the media to a neural induction uh, medium which we think promotes uh, the uh, 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 development of the uh, neuroectodermal tissues but not uh, mesoderm and endoderm. Uh, and then we take those uh, balls of neuroectoderm and place them into droplets of matrix gel where we, uh, in which we culture them initially uh, in, in suspension culture and then on an uh, orbital shaker or a spinning bioreactor. You've all seen what will happen afterwards. You get these uh, human cortices that are formed. Um, I should say that occasionally we do see the formation of an of a eye, but this is very dependent on uh, cell lines. And actually, we don't, we don't. The reason why we're always showing the same <laughs> images because we don't like this. This is a diencephalon, and so, and so uh, 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 in our normal cultures, this doesn't occur very often, but it's actually really beautiful. Um, this is the cross section, so it's a cerebral organoid. We've seen uh, uh, this before with a ventricular zone uh, differentiating neurons. Um, uh, we see uh, axons growing out, 
with the axons often bundle together. Uh, we see long dendritic trees. One thing that is important to note is that the neurons are um, actually uh, electrically active. Uh, this is a movie that is different from the one we originally had in the paper because we've added BDNF and GDNF to the culture, which actually really improves uh, this. Um, and we have used the method to actually recapitulate uh, microcephaly as a disorder. We used uh, IPS cells from a patient who suffers from microcephaly and we obtain organoids that are much smaller than the normal organoids. Um, and uh, when we look at those organoids at an early stage of development, we find that there's premature neuronal differentiation. We've identified the gene that is mutant in this uh, patient. It is called CDK5 RAP2. It had been known before and also been implicated in microcephaly before. Um, but in our case, there were two uh, mutations, both of which introduce premature stops. The protein is gone, and we can show that the orientation of the progenitor cell division um, um, is incorrect. So uh, 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 one hypothesis, although I should say that this work doesn't include alternative, uh, exclude alternative hypotheses, is that in a normal uh, uh, developing cortex or also a normal developing organoid, the mitotic spindle is perfectly organ oriented parallel to the ventricular surface. And this is very important to uh, achieve an equal splitting of the apical and basal plasma membrane domain in between the two daughter cells and to sustain long-term symmetric division. But uh, in the patient-derived organoids, uh, this uh, precise spindle orientation is not maintained. And for that reason, the cells start to undergo premature neuronal differentiation. And this leads ultimately to an insufficient expansion of the progenitor pool uh, to a generation of neurons that are generated too early. Uh, but ultimately, the number of neurons is uh, far too low. One thing that is uh, very important is that we have uh, to, to, to be sure that this mutation uh, is actually responsible uh, for the phenotype. We've repaired the uh, uh, mutation, and by um, um, I'm repairing one of those two stop colons back to the, uh, 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 um, to the uh, healthy uh, sequence, uh, both the size of the organoid and the premature neuronal differentiation can be repaired. Now, uh, one thing that I quickly wanted to touch upon uh, is that the cortex not only uh, contains excitatory neurons that I was talking about uh, so far, but also um, uh, 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 inhibitory um, interneurons. And uh, we wanted to model the uh, integration of, we wanted to generate a model for the integration of those uh, interneurons into the dorsal uh, cortex. Now, this is a bit complicated because it involves the interaction between multiple brain areas. The interneurons are born in the ventral cortical region, the medial and uh, uh, lateral ganglionic uh, eminences, and then they migrate tangentially into the dorsal areas of the um, cortex. And uh, in, our, in Madeleine's or original work, we already had suspected that this interneural migration might occasionally be recapitulated in uh, the, the cerebral organoids. We were lucky to catch uh, one organoid in a way so that we would section both a ventral and a dorsal cortical region. And you see these carotenin-positive cells, which uh, in, a, in, a, in a higher magnification look uh, morphologically like they um, would be uh, migrating interneurons. But chiretin is not a unique marker for uh, migrating um, interneurons. And second, this is really a very lucky shot because, uh, organ uh, because one of the big problems of cerebral organoids is that, I think uh, Sergio mentioned this already, it, when you section them, you basically randomly section them. Right? I want to illustrate this here. Uh, uh, if this is a normal brain, this is how a organoid will look like that various parts are present, but they are arranged in a random way. So if you then randomly section through this, you have to be extremely lucky to catch the right regions. And to, 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 to overcome this, um, Josh Bagley in my lab actually generated a method for uh, recapitulating orientations in an organoid. This is very similar to the method that uh, Sergio has already uh, uh, mentioned, but it is uh, 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 to some degree um, 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 distinct. That's why I wanted to mention it. So we uh, pattern organoids with cyclopamine uh, towards a pure dorsal fate and with a, a wind inhibitor and a sonic agonist to a pure ventral fate. 
One is labeled with uh, RFP, the other one with uh, GFP. Uh, and we, we carry them through all the way until uh, matrigel embedding and then co-embed two of these organoids into one droplet of uh, matrigel. And over time we see the complete fusion of those organoids. Um, we can then see that there are certain cells that migrate from this ventral into the dorsal cells. When we do sections, we see that, that, that uh, these are cells that have a migratory phenotype and when we focus in onto this, we see that they are all positive for uh, the interneuron uh, marker um, GET1 and they have, the, mic uh, they have the, the, the shape of actually migrating um, um, interneurons. Now, uh, we've used many, many different markers for various subtypes of uh, interneurons, uh, somatostatin, neuropeptide Y, carbindin, calretinin, uh, to some degree also parvalbumin, uh, and, uh, and we find all of these subclasses of interneurons in these um, um, organoid assays. But the reason why I actually wanted to mention them is because this now allows us to do live imaging on, uh, uh, on, on interneuron migration. And I find that interneuron migration, I think we heard something about this from Sergio already, is one of the most complex but also one of the most beautiful cell migratory um, processes. For this, we developed a method that is actually very similar to what Madeleine was uh, mentioning. These are uh, uh, thick 250 micron slices, which we also can culture for up to um, three weeks in culture. And uh, the published part includes uh, interneuron migration, but we are currently also using this for following axon tracts that go from one part of the brain uh, into the other and for regenerating some of the major uh, axonal uh, tracts in the in the developing uh, brain. I just wanted to show you some of these movies. Uh, this is a migrating interneuron, and you can see that actually the 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 the, the, the movie starts. Here's the cell body, uh, and it always starts to send out these individual uh, axon-like protrusions, and then makes the decision to actually keep one of them, but retract all the others. Sometimes this uh, can actually be a minor one, uh, like in this case, uh, and then the the the, the uh, 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 cell body will actually follow. This is a more realistic view. You can see multiple neurons. If you focus on this one, you will see that it goes all the way around the entire field um, um, of the movie. Uh, it will continuously uh, send out uh, 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 axon-like projections um, and uh, will then migrate through the um, entire field. So what does this allow us to do? This allows us to, do, to test certain uh, compounds. We use the uh, inhibitor of uh, CXCR4, which is a receptor of a kinokine that has been implicated in um, uh, interneuron migration, but if you knock it out in the mouse, it doesn't completely prevent uh, interneuron migration. What's important is that this is actually a compound that's, that's, that's actually used as a drug, uh, and so it has some clinical relevance. And what we find is that, at least in the human system, this uh, completely inhibits the um, uh, uh, migration of uh, interneurons from the ventral um, into the dorsal part of the um, developing brain. So the results are slightly different from what, you, what the no mouse knockout would actually um, suggest. So we've generated a system that we can now use to look at the uh, interaction of various different uh, uh, brain regions and uh, to, to re-establish order in those um, organoids. But what I would like to do for the last, how, mu how much time do I have? It's half an hour, right? Yeah, okay, so what I wanted to do for the last part is I wanted to show you something which is, uh, some story which is, which is actually still um, unpublished, so maybe we can turn the video off uh, for this. In the end, I just wanted to acknowledge the many people who have actually contributed to this. Of course, my big thanks to uh, Madeleine, who really has started the entire field of organoid research uh, in my lab. Uh, I mentioned the interneuron migration assay, which was set up by Josh Begley, a postdoc in my lab, all the tumor work, uh, was done by Sean Bian in my lab. Veronica Kren works on the Zika virus, uh, and the Zika work is a collaboration with Ali Miranzani at the Karolinska. These are the organizations that fund our work, and uh, thanks to all of you for listening to me.